Fox Church. We are so glad you have joined us. We want you to participate in this time gathered with your box. We want you to crank up the volume and sing with all your might. Clap, be intimate with the Lord. Be excited about praising Him. Let Him be your audience as you worship. If you wanna go off to a quiet place and lay face down before the Lord, you do that. This is a time in which we want you to encounter Jesus in a real way, in the safety of real community. After the message is over, there will be some discussion questions for you to talk about. Be open and transparent during that time. You never know how your story and your struggles may help someone sitting right around you. And as you gather together in your box, know that you are joining with people in other parts of the world, worshiping in this exact same way. So what are you waiting for? Let's stand to our feet and get excited about worshiping our risen Savior.
give you love Oh, your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend in the goodness of God Come to the 
water's edge all you who are thirsty come oh come and listen Come to the water's edge, all you who know and fear the Lord. Come and listen. Come to the water's edge, all you who are thirsty. Come. Let me tell you. What he has done for me Let me tell you what he has done for me Has done for us Has done for you oh, Come and listen Come to the water's edge, all you who know and fear the Lord. Oh, come and listen. Oh, come to the water's edge, all you who are thirsty. Let me tell you what he has done for me. Let me tell you what he has done for me. Has done for you. Has done for us. Come and listen. Come and listen Oh, come and listen Oh, come and listen hallelujah yes come and listen come and listen all you who know and fear the Lord amen you know the Bible has a thing or two to say about listening in Proverbs 2 2 it says turn your ear to wisdom turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding you know, as we uh, go along in the learning process, we have to first be able to listen, to hear instruction. Amen. And then we need to be able to process that and then be able to apply it. You know, I think God is telling us, you know, turn your ear to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. I will give you good instruction. I will give you wisdom. But you have to process that and you have to apply it with all of your heart. Amen. God has an answer waiting for you. But we have to turn our ear as the scripture says. Turn our ear to his words. Listen to his words and receive his instruction and his wisdom and then apply it. You know, in this moment, let's just continue to worship him and to honor him. And yes, in the quietness of this time, listen to him. Hallelujah. 
Let's continue to worship. Amen. Amen. So glad that we get the privilege of worshiping Jesus Christ, the risen one. Would you bow your head with me at this time before we open up God's word? I think we need to prepare our hearts just to hear from God and to come into his presence to express our hearts and our desires to him. So would you just bow your head and close your eyes right there where you are nobody looking around. You just come and get quiet before God and let's just be intimate with him and seek his face and pour out our heart to him in this time right now. Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for this moment. I thank you, God, that you are the resurrected one. You are mighty to save. You are awesome. You are worthy. And God, I choose to worship you right now. Lord, I know that we come with a finite understanding of our circumstances, a finite understanding of sometimes the things that we're going through. 
But Lord, we know that you are good. Lord, we know that you are righteous and we know that you never change. And God, that you love your people. Man, you love your people. Do you know that God is good? Do you recognize him as good? Can you just confess that before God and say, God, you are good. Can you say that to God? God, you are good. I love what David writes in Psalm 51. Just listen. Let the word of God wash over you. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me again the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Man, that is my prayer. God, I want to be have a clean heart before you. God, I, I want to have the joy of your salvation be my ultimate joy. And God, make me willing to obey you, oh God. I'm willing, Lord. Make me willing to obey you. Hey, nothing hidden from God. Nothing of us living in our own power, in our own way. No, no. We live before Jesus and we just say, Jesus Christ, make me willing to obey you. God, what a privilege it is. What a privilege it is to come into your presence. What a privilege it is to call you friend, to call you friend. And God, that's exactly who you are to us. And because of that, we can come into your presence and express the deepest longings of our heart. Cast all your care upon me. That's what Jesus says, because I care for you. I care for you. And so with that being said, what's weighing you down? What's troubling you? Man, what is the devil whispering in your ear that you need to take to God and not argue with the devil about, but you need to come into the presence of God and hear a word from God. You need to just say, Lord, my marriage is struggling or my children or my fight, whatever it is, whatever it is, situations at work and you need wisdom. The book of James says, if anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives freely. And so we can ask for wisdom. So right now, whatever it is, would you just express your heart to God right now? And maybe your desire is just to say, man, I want to just tell Jesus how awesome he is, how great he is. Can you spend some time just telling the master who he is to you? You do that right now. Well, Holy Spirit, as we get to the time in our service where we're going to open up your word, I pray, Lord, that we be ready to receive. And so we just need to say to you, Holy Spirit, you turn your searchlight on. Anything in me that doesn't look like Jesus or act like Jesus or talk like Jesus, you just reveal that to me, Lord, so that I can repent. But God, don't keep me where I am. Lord, you take me and you, you draw me deeper into your presence as we listen to your word and as we obey your word. So God, we give this time to you with pleasure and joy. And we pray, God, that you would change us from the inside out. Do your work, do your mighty work in our life. We're trusting you, Lord, for these results. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
For the last several weeks, we've been looking at this verse found in Philippians chapter 3. What a passage. Let's look at it together. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. If you've been following us, we broke this passage apart in five messages. That's how deep this passage is. And I didn't want us to gloss over it and miss much of what Paul was saying here. I wanted us to take our time as we discover what it truly means to know the Lord. This is the last installment of this passage. But before we go any further, let's review this understanding of knowing the Lord through the eyes and through the lens of the Apostle Paul. In this tender moment, in dealing with the church in Philippi, the Apostle opened up his heart and he expressed his deepest longing to them. And Paul said that the priority of his life was found in knowing Jesus, nothing else, that I may know him. Let me ask you, is that your priority? With all of the distractions pulling at us, and with all of the things vying for our attention, can we truly say that the utmost desire of our hearts is to know Jesus more and more? Well, Pastor Matt, how do we do that? Listen, this is you and I spending personal time with God with an open Bible, longing to be with Him. And it's time that requires you to be still in his presence, not to be productive, but to commune with him, getting to know him, worshiping in his presence, repenting, confessing, and listening to him, and singing to him, and obeying his every word. It's where you have moments during the week that you come into the presence of the Lord and you just commune with Him. And then you have ongoing moments with Him, moments throughout the day where you talk with Him in your car or, or as you walk around the neighborhood or as you make decisions. Every one of them is with the Lord Jesus Christ in mind. It's personal. It's personal. It is getting to know the Lord just as you get to know your husband or wife or friend. And Paul also said that he wanted to know the power of the resurrected Christ, knowing Jesus as he lived and operated in Paul's life. And do you know that's what the Christian life is? It is constantly yielding to the direction and influence of the Lord. One of my former pastors, Dr. Adrian Rogers, would talk about his personal time with the Lord. And I believe Dr. Rogers walked with God. He was a godly man. And he would talk about spending time in his study with Jesus. And he would lift his hands three times to the Lord. First, he would lift his hands in praise. Lord, I praise you. And then he would lift his hands receiving. Lord, I receive anything that you want to give to me. And then he would lift his hands like a bank robber caught in the act. Lord, I give up. Lord, I surrender. Lord, I yield to your will. And listen, I often try to do the same thing in my time with the Lord, and maybe you can too. 
Paul goes on to say that he wants fellowship with Jesus, even in the area of suffering. And I firmly believe that Paul just wanted to know Jesus in every possible way and to endure everything that Jesus had to endure, to be one with his Lord so that he could fully know him. And as we discovered last time, Paul wanted to know Jesus even in the place of death. Not physical death, but death to himself. You know, Jesus had to die to his own will. As he submitted to the Father, he said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And Paul says, put me to death so that only Jesus is seen in me and so that only his will is done in my life. And then he closes his heart cry with these words. Our text for today, look, it says, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Well, what does he mean by this? Well, before I tell you what this means, I want to tell you what it doesn't mean. Paul was not wanting to know Jesus in order that he can go to heaven. This is in no way Paul saying that he hopes to get to heaven by doing some good works or trying to earn favor or merit with Almighty God. Uh, after all, it was Paul who wrote these words to the Ephesian believers, and hopefully you know these by heart. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, this is a gift from God, not of works, so that no man can boast. And to Timothy he wrote these words, it is not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So this was not for the Apostle Paul, I want to know him, and I want to know Jesus in power, and I want to know Jesus in suffering, and I want to know Jesus in surrender, so that hopefully one day I can experience eternal life. No, Paul knew where he was going when he died. But this whole passage, what is it based on? Remember, it's based on the apostles' deepest longings. We're pulling back the curtains and catching a glimpse into the intimate desires of the apostle Paul's life. And since we've done that, what have we seen when we pulled back to see into his life? What have we seen that fills every crevice of Paul's heart? J-E-S-U-S. -S. So let me tell you what Paul is saying here. This is Paul admitting, longing, and desiring to know Jesus in perfection, in a perfect way. Let me read for you out of the Amplified Bible what Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers about this very thing and this very subject. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. For now, in this time of imperfection, we see in a mirror dimly a blurred reflection, a riddle, an enigma. But then, when the time of perfection comes, we will see reality face to face. Now I know in part, just in fragments, but then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known by God. Do you understand what Paul is saying? He's saying, I can only know on this earth Christ in a limited way. I can only know him and experience him so much. But one day, when I experience the resurrection of the dead, I will attain my goal of seeing him face to face. This is what Paul is saying. 
Knowing Jesus on earth? Yes. Knowing Jesus as he lives his life in me on this earth? Yes. Knowing Jesus in surrender as he leads me on this earth? Yes. But one day, knowing Jesus and seeing Jesus face to face, that's what he's longing for. Knowing Jesus in absolute perfection. In essence, what Paul was saying is this, the one that I've hungered for and longed for and lived to obey, one day I'm going to behold him face to face. Listen to Revelation chapter 21. Here's what it says. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people God himself will be with them and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And for every Christ follower, that's the culmination of the journey, is it not? When we see Jesus, it will be worth it all. When we dwell with the Lord forever and He with us with no more pain and no more sin and no more sickness or death, folks, we cannot put into words what that is going to be like and I can't wait for that day. And honestly, Paul, even while living on this earth in his physical body, he longed to be in the presence of the Lord. Early on in the book of Philippians, he tells the church that he's writing this letter to them while sitting in prison. And notice what he tells them in Philippians chapter 1. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between these two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. Wow. Paul, while in prison, didn't know whether he was going to be allowed to keep on living or be executed. And he didn't really care. For him, to live means living for Jesus and his purposes. To die, in his words, is even better. Why? Why would he say that? Because he was going to meet Jesus face to face. Do you know what makes heaven, heaven? It is not the new bodies that we're going to receive, or the new surroundings, or the new things that we will be able to do. No, no, no. What makes heaven, heaven? is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. There is this quote by John Piper that I love, and here's what it says. 
The critical question for our generation and for every generation is this. If you could have heaven with no sickness and with all the friends you ever had on earth and all the food you ever liked and all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed and all the natural beauties you ever saw, all the physical pleasures you ever tasted and no human conflict or any natural disasters, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ was not there? And Paul would say emphatically, I would not want to go if Jesus was not there. There would be no joy if Jesus was not there. Heaven would not be heaven. And the question comes back to us. What would you say about that question? What would you say? Could you enjoy heaven if Jesus wasn't there? Let me ask you, be honest with me. Do you know Jesus? Do you desire to know him more and more? Do you know him like the apostle Paul knew him? Do you long to be with him in heaven? Let me close with this poem by Carrie Breck. She writes, face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be when with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me? Only faintly now I see him with the darkling veil between. But a blessed day is coming when his glory shall be seen. Face to face, O blissful moment. Face to face to see and know. Face to face with my Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who loves me so. Lord, may this be our deepest desire as well. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me, Lord Jesus Christ? I thank you for this real moment and this series of knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, that I may know you. God, I pray that it is the chief desire of our hearts to know you, Lord, to know you, Lord. Oh God, I pray that you would take away all the distractions, that you would take away all the hindrances, and God, that our ultimate goal would be to know you, Lord, to know you in every possible way, to commune with you on a consistent basis throughout the week and throughout the days. God, I just thank you for the testimony of the Apostle Paul, how he was so real and transparent and he said, my chief desire, the ultimate goal of my life is to know you, Jesus, and one day know you face to face. Are you looking forward to seeing Jesus? Are you looking forward to knowing him fully and completely and being fully known by him? What makes heaven heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he is not there, I don't want to go. I don't want to go, but Lord, I know that you are going to be there. God, may we just say we choose to live our lives in complete surrender and dependence upon you while living on this earth so that one day when we stand before you, we hear these words, well done, my good and faithful servant. So God, I just pray that you would help us be ready for heaven. And as we discuss this in our group with one another, I pray, God, that we would encourage each other and spur one another on towards love and good deeds and living not for this life, but living for the life to come. God, we give this time to you, O precious Savior, in Jesus' name, amen.
I am so glad that you worship Jesus with Box Church. Know that this is just the beginning point for your box for the rest of the week. Again, this is about living in community with one another. So eat together, take the Lord's Supper together, pray together, get to know one another, and enjoy the company of those in your box, and spend time thinking about how you can financially bless the community, the nation, and the world. And when you gather together again, do so in the company of new people that you have brought to the Lord. Continue to be the church and continue to bless the community right where you are.